Welcome everyone to our Future Terms panel. Um, my name is Jenny Manny and Christ. Um, I am the Program Welfare and Access Manager at Teach First. I'll be facilitating, hosting this panel. Um, and welcome to our audience. Um, we're really excited to be exploring why authentic representation is vital in schools. So we've got a lovely panel of experts here. Um, we'll let everyone sort of get settled in. Um, give a few minutes for everyone to join. Um, do be reminded that the panel is being recorded. So we'll be able to share this with future audiences. So if you're not tuning in live, welcome to the recording. Um, and if you're in the audience, uh, you can use the Zoom Q&A functionality, which should be at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions. Um, my colleague will be picking up on questions toward the end of the panel. So we'll have dedicated time for Q&A. Um, we won't be able to get through all the questions, um, but please do, yeah, feel free to, to pop those into the, the Q&A bar and we'll come to you toward the end once we've had some discussion from our lovely panelists. So welcome. Um, Dominic Arnold is the Chief Executive of the LGBT Inclusion Organization, Just Like Us. Um, and I'd really love for you, Dominic, to read out your opening statement. Um, you've got about three minutes and we'd love to sort of hear what you have to say to kick us off on our topic. Okay. Um, well, firstly, I, th I thought it was a really uh, interesting uh, subject for your panel. I think um, the issue of LGBT plus representation, which is what I'm going to talk about because it's the only one I have any authority to speak on, um, comes to me down to a duty for a school to uh, prepare young people for life outside of school, um, which of course should be a duty for all schools. I think being LGBT plus is interesting because it's an identity that you're unlikely to share with your immediate family and therefore young people who don't see representation at school and are unlikely to see it at home probably won't see it at all um, when we work with young people even today they will frequently say i thought i was the only one uh, when i was in school i thought i was the only one that felt like me and of course that can be incredibly damaging and it's an incredible burden for any young person to bear um, we did a bit of research that I thought was very interesting. Uh, we researched, we did a piece of research with more than 500 teachers and asked them, what's the most important intervention for LGBT inclusion? And we asked young people the same thing. What we found was that it wasn't the specific intervention. It was the fact that people did something. So strangely, and not great for us, <laughs> because we were hoping to find out what to prioritize. Um, but the huge, the huge distance was between schools that did something and schools that did nothing. Um, and that, and that was where we really saw the distance. So I'd say something is always better. It just goes to show it's not what you do, it's the fact that the representation is there. And then with my last minute, I, <laughs> I think I'm about on time. I want to say that equally important than LGBT plus representation is the kinds of LGBT plus people we show. Uh, because all too often the LGBT plus people we show will be white, will be cis, will be male. Um, and the trouble with that is it gives a perception of what it is to be LGBT. So it's really important when we're talking about LGBT plus diversity, we're showing LGBT people who are also people of color, uh, disabled LGBT plus people, LGBT plus people from faith communities, uh, just to make sure that we're being very clear that there is no one way to be LGBT plus a huge group of people. And that's it from me. Thank you so much, Dominic. Rich pickings for our conversation, I think. I'm really interested in that research you mentioned. Um, maybe we can come back to it in just a little bit. Um, Adrian, I'd love to come to you next. So I'll just introduce you quickly, Adrian Rollins. Um, proud to have you on the call today. Um, so I know that you're deputy head of school at, uh, do you say Noosa, Nottingham University, Samworth Academy? I'm gonna go with Noosa for sure. Noosa, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, would you like to share some of your opening thoughts? Yeah, um, in terms of opening thoughts, just talk a bit about my life experience. Um, when it comes to uh, diversity and, you know, when people ask me about my experiences, well, in education, for example, well, I've been I've been black my whole life, so it's not my my experiences go before I would be worked in education. They go back to when I was in education as a student, and also in my prior career as a professional sportsman. So I was a professional sportsman for ten years before I went into education, and when I went into education, it, the expectation would have been then for me to go into PE. Uh, being a former sportsman, but um, I kind of knew because of my my background that that was that firstly that wasn't who I was. I was particularly strong at maths, so that was the route that I went down. And 
Um, for me, my experience in education has, has been I've worked all, all in various parts of the country and in various leadership roles um, as a director of maths and then as an assistant head and then also um, in my second deputy headship, so my, in my uh, fourth stroke, fifth year as a deputy head. And there's been some blockages. Um, there's been blockages because um, my focus being coming from a curriculum focused background, it's often seen that someone of my background is often good at being a head of year, good at working with the good relationships with students, and, and that's kind of been the ceiling. Um, so I've kind of gone down the curriculum route in my in my in my journey. And um, that's that's often seen as different. Uh, but for me, I've been proud of my heritage my whole life. My grandparents came over during the Windrush generation and they worked in factories. And their ambition for their children, who initially were in the Caribbean, was for them to, when they brought their children over was to not work in factories, like to work in offices. So that was the ambition for them. And when I think about my mother and my their generation, well, my mother and was a single parent of three boys in East London, and she initially worked from home, and then she went into education herself. So my mum is Marva Rollins, who was um, a head teacher for 24 plus years, she says, basically half a term away from 25 years in, in North London and East London. A successful one and she kind of cast the die for me to go into education she never told me I always liked working with young people as well as playing cricket I, I used to coach and that seemed something that I I, would, I kind of fell into but then also loved and so in terms of my experiences um, you know the thing that's been good for me is that I've had a mentor in, in my mother and other people who have been um, associated with her and that's been fortunate for me but I've had a lot of blockages I've had a lot of um, a kind of you know, this is not kind of for you. However, I, I push forward. Um, working at Noosa has been a, a breath of fresh air and it's been absolutely fantastic because they've been thoroughly supportive and um, I, I work with a great leadership team there. So um, the key thing for me, the message to me is that, is that whatever your dreams are, you have to pursue them. And like I said, my I've been black my whole life. So therefore, my experiences go beyond education. However, you know, I'm now, I mean, as a senior leader, I'm in the, the one point or two point seven percent of, of black male senior leaders in the country. And I know my responsibility around that and how I have to be a role model, not just for the black students, but for all students. But I think it's important for students to see diversity and leadership in schools because it needs to reflect the society that we live in, which is diverse. Thank That's you so funny. much, Adrian. I'm excited to hear more about what you said about your, your leadership team and your role in it and also you know your your feeling of obligation and responsibility to your pupils and colleagues but first I'd love to come to Anu hi Anu um so obviously last but not least so Anu is digital learning coordinator um for UAL um and I'm going to hand over to you tell us tell us about your opening thoughts on our conversation well thanks for having me um I think I feel like I resonate with this topic a lot because I trained through Teach First. So my thoughts around diversity and representation is because I was part of that initiative and I really wanted to train because I wanted to teach a wide variety of students. Um, touching on what Dominic and Adrian have both said, for me, it's really about intersectional representation as well. Like I really believe in um, making sure that all students feel safe, seen and heard and that really comes through when staff feel safe, seen and heard. Um, and I think that's why it comes down to three key things for me, specifically, you know, in the classroom. Um, the first one is kind of through the curriculum, designing and implementing inclusive curriculum is very important. Um, I train to teach secondary English, so uh, diversifying the curriculum and especially with campaigns like Lit in Colour, I think have been a really great step forward recently. The second one, um, probably down the pastoral route, which is kind of challenging negative behaviours, um, not just among students, but I think the trickier one is probably among staff and the wider kind of school ecosystem uh, to challenge them and, and provide opportunities for allyship for uh, staff who might be struggling. Because I think if you are from um, a certain background where you feel like you're hyper visible, it's not very easy to uh, authentically kind of be yourself if you feel um, unsafe and, and if you feel like there are consequences for being your true self. Um, and then the final one is more of a kind of holistic, I think through webinars and panels and CPD and development, 
um, creating environments where um, staff can kind of champion diversity and kind of get stuck into projects that really uh, bring that out as well. Thank you so much. So I'm actually going to pick up on something that, that you've just said, Anu, <clears throat> because um, last year uh, there was a really excellent piece of peer-led, so pupil-led research from Race Alliance Wales. They published a, an amazing report called Show Us You Care that talked about some of the things you've just mentioned. And I think it, it leads back to, to what you said, Adrian, about facing some blockages um, during your career trajectory. They certainly talked about a representative curriculum and, and a diverse teacher workforce being really important, but they also talked about a lot of other things um, about, you know, the trauma of, of bullying. Um, you've mentioned, Anu, about the pastoral side of things being really crucial and key. So I'd love to ask all of the panelists why you think representation has a wide appeal compared to other initiatives that could have an equally important impact. We could come to Anu first. Sure. I think sometimes for kind of senior leadership, um, there is the emphasis on really honing the curriculum and then seeing how that leads to student attainment. Um, I think back to the title of this panel, which was about young people's success. And what I feel more schools need to lean into is this idea of the whole child, that if they feel like they're social emotional well-being is taken care of then that actually goes hand in hand with academic attainment um, and sometimes I think the focus on results especially if you have students from disadvantaged communities and you, we're really rooting for them to do well um, the, the wider narrative you can sort of overlook sometimes I think their social emotional well-being and their sense of belonging so Sometimes diversity is addressed as a bit of a plus or an add-on, um, but I think it could be a game changer if it is routinely embedded into the academic and kind of pastoral plans of, of schools. Thank you, Anu. You also mentioned that sense of belonging. Um, and I wondered if, if you could connect this at all, Adrian, to your, your comment before that you'd face blockages along your path, but also if you had any other thoughts about representation as a focus compared to other initiatives. Yeah, I'd like to follow on from Anu around the curriculum. I think it's really important um, that uh, first and foremost, the curriculum is, up, is what the students receive and that has to be one that is inclusive. Now, um, within the curriculum itself, um, we know that within PSHE, there's, you know, the promotion of fundamental British values and in line with the Equality Act and the protected characteristics, but that needs to be not just part of PSHE, that needs to be part of the whole curriculum. And I think schools have the license to, to do that and the, the right to do that. I know in our school, we, we very much look at our curriculum and make sure that it's not, funny enough, not about passing exams. The exams come at the end of them actually learning as opposed to learning the same kind of stuff that they would be expected to learn. Um, you know, it's not, not that kind of progression. OK, we're going to learn. Shakespeare and everything to do with Shakespeare in English and English and therefore you're going to pass your GCC. It's about just learning how to read and write effectively and that can be done through various texts and just the celebration and acknowledgement. We're very big on celebrating and, and acknowledging diversity in our school and that is really, really important. So for me, it's it's around if, if students have the confidence and learn about themselves and about others and have that respect and I, I don't like the word tolerance in in the fundamental British values, I really don't like that word, but just have that respect and understanding of each other and also themselves um, and address their, their their overall well-being, they will achieve anyway. And I think that's really, really important. And young people from all backgrounds, if they need to understand, they need to understand who they are, wh what their background is, where they come from and where they're going to and what truly their background is. Because I had a conversation today about... Um, um, not at school, but just um, in an interaction around the, the Roma community and the people understood the Roma community historically were, you know, very much associated with medicine um, and, and other high achieving things. So just the understanding of the community and having people tap into that is really, really important because if you don't understand your worth, you're not going to achieve anyway. Thank you so much, Adrian. Um, I was really curious, something in what you said made me think about kind of, you know, children and people studying at all different levels of education. And, you know, this idea that 
I think you were touching a little bit on, you know, children shape their identity all the way through school. Um, and this idea of this panel is obviously about can you be what you can't see? And I, I guess I wonder, Dominic, you you mentioned some research that you've done about interventions that work. Presumably that might have looked at different age groups and, and different sort of phases at school. Could you could you bring a little bit of that into it? You know, thinking about all the different sort of ages and, and different groups of children that are figuring out who they are all the way along. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I'm I'm a a big believer in in diversity all the way through, as as perhaps you would expect. <laughs> um, and I particularly think that in primary education, it's very very important to give examples of LGBT plus people. And I think that actually, to an extent, the LGBT plus sector, which is focused largely on secondary school, has had a bit of an own goal there, really, because um, what we're doing is we're saying that this is something that is in a sex education box, uh, and it, it must not be. Uh, you know, LGBT people exist in every walk of life. Um, most of the primary schools that I speak to have at least one set of same-sex parents. And is it not right that those children go to school and see examples of families that look like their own? Um, which I, 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 th I certainly think that it is. And I think that that's what representation is at its heart. It's about seeing people that look like look like you, look like your family, and even that don't look like you and your family, but that are part, are part of the world. Um, and I sometimes think it gets a bit of a bad rap representation because it's seen as something that can be very easy. You know, well, I'm sure you put the flag up, but, hey, you know, is, is there any of the deeper work going on? And I think that there's some really valid points in there sometimes. But I would also say that if you have nothing, and there are lots of schools that have zero LGBT representation, there are lots of schools that have zero POC representation for that matter. Um, if there is absolutely nothing and you are a teacher in that school, then putting up the first flag actually does, does matter, I think, and does say something, because LGBT students are incredibly resourceful. And little signals that you might be someone that's trustworthy can be incredibly important. And we hear all the time, all the time from young people, that they saw one teacher with a badge and they thought, thank goodness, this is someone I can approach. Um, so I think representation, um, representation is a really, really, really good start, but also must not be the end. So I can I, so I can I, thanks for that, Dominic. Can I just add in terms of, I know it's about can you be what you can't see? And it's, I think it's just reinforcing what I said. It's, it's also, can you be what you don't know? And I think that's really, really, really important. When I went to school, there was one black male teacher and he was my head of year and he was my mum's friend. So, and he was the one that forced me to attend, well, not forced, kind of coerced my mother into for me to attend that school in East London that I went to because I really didn't want to. Um, it was the right thing for me to be there because he was a, a real guide. So as well as, um, you know, having him there and he wouldn't have realised how much of a role model he was for me but he was a, a considerable role model for me because I didn't know that there was such a thing, you know, in schools. There was I didn't see any in primary school, I didn't see any in nursery school or infant school. So I didn't really know that that existed. And then once I saw him, I then had to work out for myself what that actually, what it meant. And even looking at my mum, she was a black female and head teacher. And in primary, there were more black females than, than black males. And even in my in my career, I think it's about like I didn't actually know as well as not what it was like to be I had to find out for myself what it was like to be a black male teacher and as much as I said I've been black my whole life and as and I experienced racism I did in professional sport but I had to I didn't know about it and what's happened now because of the power of the internet and the power of networking I know that there's a lot more people like me out there and that's been the I think the, the real benefit of having um technology because I know there are more people like me out there so therefore through that through that, those means I have those support systems there which I I would imagine that my my head of year did not have so and but I didn't know about that until I had to I, I came across it otherwise I, you, I felt that sometimes it was just me in many cases where I was experiencing particularly trauma in education sport but having those blockages I felt it was just me until I met people who, who looked like me and who had the similar experience that I realized oh so, until I, I didn't know so I think that's really important that uh, you that I through the power of technology I managed to find out that they were more like me so therefore I was there were people who looked like me we could support each other on our journeys and that has made a difference so I hear you on the power of networking and certainly this virtual panel couldn't be taking place if we didn't have that technology. Um, 
I wonder if we can go back to something that you touched on, Adrian, and also something, uh, Anu, that I think you also picked up on, which was about, I'm going to paraphrase now, uh, not only for you, Adrian, you said it's not only about being um, somebody to your black pupils, it's also about being somebody to all of your pupils. And, and Anu, you mentioned about being uh, maybe the one of the only people in the school who fits a particular identity or who is visible um, and so feeling the pressure of that. And I'm just thinking about our program members, some of whom teach in areas where there might be lots of people who are similar to them culturally or, or through other parts of their identity. And, and some of them teach in, in areas where they might be the only person in the school or they might be one of only a few. And I guess I, I was interested in, in any of your reflections about that because it sounds as though all of you have got some experience of being, you know, in a minority group or in a visible minority group in different contexts, but then sometimes also maybe being in a position of authority or power, for example, if you're part of a leadership team, I think maybe maybe that can change your perspective on things a bit. I guess I wondered if any of you would like to say any more about that, about not only being something for the children who are in your community, whatever that community is, but the other children as well. I think um, in my context, it was interesting because I'm um, Indian female. Um, so I taught in a school where like over 90% of the students were British Pakistani and Pakistani and Indian experiences have overlaps culturally um, coming from kind of a similar um, geographic area, but there are distinct differences as well. And I, I think for me, it was probably the intersectional element of it that really came into play during my time in the classroom, where sometimes um, it was really rewarding to connect with students um, when it comes to culture, uh, specifically, so an example is probably the English curriculum and something I've always stood by, that um, color, like writers who come from an ethnic minority background can write well. I think the English canon sometimes has an emphasis on like being very um, rooted in tradition and, and there's an emphasis that it is uh, the way to go, um, which might seem to imply that if you add writers of color, you're somehow making your curriculum easier or in some cases not as challenging. And I, and I really resisted that assumption because having grown up in India, I know that writers of color have immense craft. Um, so, so that was really rewarding and delivering that curriculum through my classroom. Uh, but the other side of it, where I'm a woman in teaching, um, there are difficult aspects of that. I think there was definitely kind of scrutiny. There's sometimes I think um, an, an invasion of like personal boundaries in terms of what students feel curious that they can ask you. Because the tricky thing is once they feel like they can approach you, um, I think as a practitioner, then you have to also put in place where the, the, the lines are drawn in terms of what conversations we can and can't have. So I think as a South Asian, I felt it incredibly rewarding, but if you add me being a South Asian woman, then there are aspects of it I found challenging. Um, so I think school leaders, if they have a look at the holistic picture and they have time to build in conversation with staff about what the experiences are like, um, then it will enrich you know, the experiences that staff face while, while they're in the classroom. Thank you so much, Annie. Did Dominic or Adrian, did you want to come in on that at all? We've got a lovely question from the audience as well, if you wanted to skip on to that. Um, yeah, I think it, I, yeah, added to that, I think it is important that your your representation is, is, is like I say, it's not just for people who look like me, it's for all the students. And in my experience, I've worked in school where diversity, where the, the student population was lacking diversity at all that's just because that's the local community and in that aspect I had to had to challenge this with the stereotypes that took place and sometimes that can be that can be difficult to then try and communicate that to the the, the people around the table or your line manager or whatever, about how um, people's negative stereotype of, of black people particularly black males um, how it's unacceptable and then when students do certain things that are out and out racist or say things that are racist that how that is totally unacceptable and, and the line that the school needs to take on that because when you are 
you know, as much as I said, I've been black my whole life and I've experienced racism my whole life. It doesn't make it acceptable at any time, or at any place or anywhere. And so when you experience those things and you don't feel that it's necessarily being dealt with, with the, the level of service that it needs to be, then sometimes you can feel it can become a very, very lonely place um, to, to work. And however, I've never been, um, not backward in coming forward, but I've never been shy of letting people know in a professional manner that I don't accept it. But I think there's a lot of education to take place around that aspect of understanding um, what, you know, that if you are tolerant of racism, that you need to understand that you are actually either encouraging racism and you may say, well, I'm not racist, and but that there's, you need to question that, you know, and that's not saying you are racist because you don't, but you need to understand if you do not understand the experience that you need to listen closely to those that do experience it. And then therefore you need to respect that a lot more. Thank you. I'd love to actually follow up and ask what good looks like in a situation like that. So what does good look like for a school to challenge or to set up a culture where obviously children particularly will sometimes say the wrong thing, make mistakes, but actually an accountable culture that honors and respects the people in the school as well as the staff, what does good look like? Um, I, I mean, I would say from my perspective, there are schools, and I think we've probably all experienced this, people who work in education, you can go into schools and it's actually quite interesting how different they are. Um, and how different they can be, particularly in terms of racism, homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia. They can all feel, you can go to one school 500 metres down the road, there's a real different undercurrent and a real different feeling about it. So I'm very interested in what the difference in no distance at all, both, for example, state provision schools, what, what is that thing? And what I've, what I've found is it's, it's a bit like culture uh, within an organisation. Um, and I think that there are schools where um, if, a, if a child says something homophobic, biphobic, transphobic or racist, they know the response they're going to get before it leaves their mouth. And it doesn't matter which teacher is there or which even which student, perhaps um, they know that that will be challenged straight away. And I think that in that environment, the, the child has far less incentive <laughs> uh, to come out with that and to keep coming out with that. And I think in contrast to that, there are other schools where, um, oh, goodness, I mean, it's very sad when we talk to our young people, there are schools where teachers will be a bit homophobic and there are stories of people, you know, being uh, shouted, you know, run faster, run faster, you prefer for whatever around the playground. Sorry for using a slur. Um, and, and, I, and I think that that in turn, you know, young people will, will, will do what they see. Um, so I think creating that culture really is the most important thing anyone can do. I, I echo that and uh, that because the school sets the culture, not the community. The, the, the school should be the hub of the community, not the other way around. And that's the, so where there is a lack of diversity in the community, a lack of uh, respect for whatever people's uh, background is, it's really important that the school doesn't then use that as an excuse to say, well, this is what the area is like. So therefore, it's going to be a, a bit of a job to challenge it. Well, that, that's the job. Because our job is to raise, like to raise children who have, um, who understand that we are in a diverse world, and then therefore, and and so therefore, this is how we treat each other. And if if schools don't take that stance, then they're failing the children, um, because ultimately that child will grow up into and go out into the the world of work, where what they thought was acceptable all of a sudden becomes unacceptable, and they truly and they truly do not understand it. So that is the role, that is our role as, as practitioners, as that's our role within school to make sure that that children are well educated, not just in terms of maths, English, science, etc., but they are educated into how the world works or how the world should work. Do you, do you know one, one thing you reminded me of, Adrian, when you said that was that there were, when I, I used to do lots of teacher training in LGBT inclusion, and something that happened fairly regularly, maybe once a month, is that you would have a white teacher that would be talking about homophobia and would say, well, it's difficult in our area. And they would 
allude to the fact basically that there were there were uh, Muslim students and therefore their job challenging homophobia was more difficult. And this is obviously problematic for lots of reasons because it's it's using one minority group to excuse not doing the right thing by another minority group. <laughs> Um, and I think we have to be very, very careful of that. Firstly, because it, it is completely and utterly untrue. We've seen schools from all different backgrounds do fantastic LGBT inclusion work, exactly as Adrian said, actually, by taking the lead um, and, and deciding that that was the culture of their institution. Um, but yeah, I just, you just reminded me of that point, uh, Adrian, that I thought I mentioned. Thank you. So I want to quickly take a question from our audience, and I want to encourage the audience to keep asking questions if, if you have them. Um, so we'll answer this one live. Um, and I think it's connected to what we've just been talking about. Um, I'd like to know any advice the panel would give to school leaders on creating a culture where all teachers can be their authentic selves. Actually, I'd like to focus us on something that we haven't yet talked about. So we've talked about different kind of identities that all of us in this panel um, have, even if we don't all share them. We haven't really talked about um, disability yet. And I'm really interested to think about um, kind of the visible and the invisible. I think a lot of the things we've talked about, some things, um, you know, people don't have any choice but to be visible um, in terms of, you know, you walk into a room and you dress a certain way or you look a certain way and you might just be marked by that difference automatically. Um, but that isn't true of, of every form of diversity. So I wonder if uh, Anu or um, Dominic or Adrian, if you have anything you'd like to add um, on that front in response to this question. I think, um, yes, creating a culture where teachers can be their authentic selves really comes down to the daily sort of provisions uh, and planning that school leaders and staff do. And what I mean by that is um, when I was a trainee, a lot of the times I would get into conversations about um, inclusion with other trainees and we had ideas and, and ways that we wanted to be involved um, but there was always this um, <clears throat> implied notion that there's a kind of hierarchy within a school and, and if you're not of a certain leadership position, um, then you don't really get to contribute. You kind of have to listen to somebody in a senior position. And then when you qualify for X, Y, Z position in five years or so, then you can take more of an active uh, role. And I think that was quite um, sort of... Uh, disappointing because we felt like we had to hold on to all of our thoughts and just say them to ourselves as younger teachers but there wasn't anything we could do in terms of impact uh, in a wider school basis so I'd say when it comes to um, championing you know the needs and and honoring like uh, staff who have uh, visible and, and invisible disabilities um, get get teachers involved and get all kinds of teachers involved um, have teachers actively create CPD and create um, curriculum projects that others can kind of get on board with um, and let's sort of get rid of the sense that only there's certain hierarchy involved in in planning the programs because you'd be surprised how passionate um, early career teachers are about these issues and what they can bring um, to the table. Thank you. I'm definitely not surprised by that actually um, but uh, thank, I absolutely take the point. Um, so there's something in there about maybe democratizing the way that that some of that culture shift is decided upon in the school. Adrian or Dominic, I wondered if you could come in on some of those other points. I think the the I'm, I am really curious about the disability point actually because there's a real underrepresentation of disabled teachers at all levels um, within education, um, and there is a huge disability employment gap in the UK that is certainly true also in schools. Um, but there is research um, that very clearly shows us that having disabled teachers and having diverse teachers generally, but I'll focus for a minute on disability, having disabled teachers is really beneficial for pupils who have disabilities as well. Um, so I'm kind of curious, uh, Adrian, especially for you as someone who's in a, in a leadership role in a school, um, you know, how, if you have any experience in your roles of thinking about that or good examples of disability inclusion, well, in terms of my experience, I mean, I've, I've worked in, in various schools where we have had a, a extremely diverse, including disability. Ultimately, the school's culture boils down to the integrity of the leadership. Even though we're talking about everyone being involved, it boils down to the integrity of the leadership of the school. And 
if that isn't there and we're not talking about this something to put on the school website to talk about this is what we believe in and a nice lovely you know mission statement which you know there's no, there won't be a single school in the in the uk that hasn't got a nice mission statement to say what they do it's actually in their actions so for me it's about that integrity and the, the integrity comes out of what they actually what is actually done as opposed to what is actually said so when it comes to disability um it's it's just really really important that i mean we have you know i've worked in schools where there's been um uh, deaf teachers i've worked in school where there's been uh wheelchair uh, based staff so um and that speaks to what you know what it is and it does make a difference to the students there um i find that because again like in my experience someone who looks like me um can, they feel like they, they're someone who understands me it might not just be the case when i went to school there was lots of teachers who were very supportive of me but i think it does make a difference but that can only come through if there is a real core integrity from the leadership because ultimately when it comes to recruitment and selection it comes from them can i quickly um just add to something that adrian what you were talking about reminded me actually during the pandemic um obviously teaching staff were quite anxious about like when we had that first lockdown the return to school and something that i saw in my school that was really wonderful was senior leadership like like adrian like taking that time to sit with staff who have disabilities and say what does a plan look like for you like what would you what do you need from us and on a day to day basis how can we make you feel safe when you're in the building what measures can we introduce and also the concept of like open door policies where you can go to SLT and you can chat to them about any anxieties that you may have because obviously we've seen that the pandemic kind of shifts and changes and some months you might feel okay and then suddenly something new will come up and and you feel worried all over again um so i think just that having an open door communication policy and making sure that you can make adjustments and and you're keeping them in mind i think that will help staff feel really reassured Thank you. I think you've touched on something interesting there, Anu, about this idea almost of shifting sand. And certainly that's been true of the pandemic. And I think your point about open open door policies and, and your point, Adrian, about integrity being shown by leadership is really crucial. You made me think of something else, actually. And Dominic, I'd love if you could come in on this. Um, you know, thinking about uh, people who maybe have the choice to be open <clears throat> or to choose not to be open about their identity in school. Um, do you have any research or, or sort of insight you can offer about maybe the different strategies that that teachers might use to determine if a school is a safe environment? Um, is that something that your that your research at Just Like Us has ever looked at, Dominic? It's not. We haven't looked at that specifically. I mean, I think that generally LGBT plus people are pretty good at knowing when uh, when we can be ourselves and when we can't. And I think actually lots of us have been in that situation where someone will say something and you'll think, not today. <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna mention anything today because this is not, this is not a safe environment. Um, and I think the good news is that it works the other way as well. So sometimes you can be with a group of people and someone will say something, maybe it's a political thing that they'll say that, and you'll think, oh, that's all right. I can I can talk about this aspect of my character now, and I I know that I know that I'm okay. Um, and I think schools can do that really well. And I think it it, it it comes back down to representation. You know, if if there is an out member of staff, then I think that speaks volumes. Um, we send young volunteers all over the country into schools to talk about their identity, and a lot of the time they do. A teacher will say, Oh, by the way, I'm, I'm gay, and I really enjoyed that, um, but I'm not out at work. Um, and the reasons teachers aren't out of work are complex. Uh, we know that teachers can be out of work. There, there are schools that have, have supportive teachers that are out as LGB and T, so it's definitely possible. Um, but I think that um, one thing that does seem not unique, I'm sure, to teaching, but particular, uh, is that staff can still be told not to come out. Um, if you did that in a bank, you'd be in court. <laughs> um, but there are still there are still environments, absolutely, where, where staff are told it's your personal life. Uh, it's not something we bring to work. And yet, of course, um, you know, heterosexual couples will have wedding rings on, um, you know, uh, photos and, and and all sorts. So I think um, I, th I think there needs to be I think at policy level there needs to be a discussion. Um, about LGBT people at work uh, in schools. Um, 
but but I think it, it, it's incredibly difficult. Um, and the, the difficulty is, as always, uh, the burden rests with that individual teacher. Uh, so whether or not to make that decision, a person could be taking still in 2022 could be taking their career in their hands, which is obviously terribly unfair. Um, I'd like to add uh, to that in terms of when it comes to kind of understanding or just in terms of representation, in my experience with young people and, and uh, children and young people, they seem more open and flexible to the world that we live in than the adults. So there seems to be more, there needs to be more time invested in the adults in schools than the children. We have children who, you know, we have we might have girls or boys walking to school hand in hand and nobody would bat an eyelid. No other student would bat an eyelid at all. It's not, it's just not even it's almost like it's just how it is and sometimes people from an older generation or from a, a different background struggle with that and it's, it's about people wanting to be themselves but when I was thinking about from a race perspective about being black um, there's there's also that thing sometimes people might be from a as a as a black male so I've had experiences where I thought, let me not say that because people might think, there he goes, being black again. The black male who's aggressive or got a, a chip on his shoulder and all those kind of things where I found myself in in situations where I've worked where I thought, oh, I can't, I can't sh really show my emotions because people might perceive me as being an aggressive black male. So being yourself can sometimes be a, a, a can be a challenge and I have found, not, not now because I've got to a, a point in my life where to be honest, I'm not really bothered. So I mean, I'm 50 now, so therefore uh, uh, I'm not I'm not that bothered. It doesn't mean I'm aggressive, but I will say what needs to be said because it's important, and it's important that you that you speak um, when it's necessary and and important to say that. So without worrying about how people perceive you, because people may perceive you that way anyway. Thank you. What I hear from everyone in different ways here is that there's a lot of care and thought that individual teachers at any level of the profession at any level of career experience have to put into how they comport themselves in the workplace how they present themselves in the workplace how they express themselves sounds like there's a degree of pick your battles and I'm sure that's probably true also of people's how much of myself do I show in this setting um, just to sort of um, start to bring us a little bit to a close um, I was I was really interested um, <clears throat> in some research that I was reading recently that talked about, um, again, this idea of representation. Um, it was focusing on homophobia in schools and it was looking at other than, other than teachers being out in school, which is obviously wonderful and brilliant. And I certainly wish I'd had more knowledge if there were out teachers in my school. It wasn't something we talked about when I was at school. Um, but it talked about the ways that um, like homophobia or even just heteronormativity is kind of taught without anything without anything having to do with who is out or who is not out, if that makes sense. So I guess there's a culture piece. We've talked about this a lot already, haven't we? Um, these, these different things that are normalized. So if you can cast your minds back, I'm really curious if you have any particular memories of one thing when you were at school as a child that you realize now was one of those moments of something being normalized uh, that, for example, you know, all parents are mums and dads, that turned out not to be true. Is there a memory that strikes any of you of, of a moment when you were in school when that happened? I definitely I think, think um, I have a few. <laughs> mine is probably a bit different because like I said, uh, so I grew up in India till I was 16 and then I moved to the UK um, and I lived across England and Scotland. So I think my, it's a bit of a salad of experiences, if you will. Um, but uh, I was told from a very young age, um, unfortunately from certain like teachers that women should not be, um, sh should not say controversial things and, and they shouldn't. Um, there's this implication of like, you're good, you're a good student and, and you're a good female student if you are, um, subservient and if you are polite because that implies that you're nice and and that's it reflects well and, and it would come across especially when um, I've always been pretty kind of outgoing and, and I've always had quite strong opinions about the things I care about 
Um, and I, I would use that and I would try and go for positions in my school, such as your prefect or head of a house. And I would always get the same as like, oh, but we think you're a bit too brash and, and you're a bit too. And I think there are definitely some sexist connotations that now as, as, a, as a sort of teacher myself, I've sort of realized, no, that's absolutely not the case. But I think the best part of my journey in education has been finding those girls who remind me of myself and getting them involved. And um, if I've been in pastoral conversations where uh, someone said, oh gosh, she's just really too much. And for me to actually sort of say, well, well why do you think she's too much? Or, or to sort of challenge those assumptions and then champion those girls and, and then tell them that, you know, they can do what they want pretty much. And, and that way, you know, like um, Adrian and, and Dominic have touched on before, it's about these students going out into the world um, ready to be their fullest self and and not having to undo any damaging experiences from school to, to really get out there and be ready to thrive. Yeah, similarly, when I think back to school, I I mean, I, I noticed it was whether it was just necessarily just because of race. Back then it was children should be seen and not heard. So therefore, that was the, uh, that was the I want to say unspoken rule because it was spoken about a lot. And um, then that in school is different you I, I think thinking back that that you had to respect your teacher when you were at school and I think sometimes that's that has changed a lot these days but at the same time respect needs to be a, a two-way thing you don't just get respect because you're the teacher so in terms of how I interact with all students but particularly if, if I think about my interaction with uh, young men who who look like me I do encourage them to speak because I didn't have a voice when I was at school. I had to go along with what I, I went along with. I recall even my options. And this is that time of the year when students choose their options. I chose French and Spanish. I still remember this to this day. It's been that long, but I still remember it. But I remember choosing French and Spanish in my options because I liked languages. And the person who was in charge of my options said, well, you're going to be a professional cricketer. They don't play cricket in France and Spain. So what are you choosing that for? And it said, go and do art. And I, I can't, even to this day, I, I can't draw. Um, but um, I was too scared. And, and that was that stereotype, well, you're going to be a sportsman. So it doesn't really even matter what you're going to do. So there was that stereotype being a black um, male and sportsman. And now it, within my role and having been a sportsman anyway, um, and understanding that your life is more than professional sport because that can especially I played cricket but if it's football whatever it is when I see young boys who look like me who want to aspire to first of all I have no problem with that however I do emphasize that it's not just about that and also to speak to them about how in order to be a professional sports person you need to be more than just being able to kick a ball well being able to throw something well being able to run well you have to be a rounded character and that's why school is here so I encourage them to speak and have a voice but it's giving them a voice so then they can be communicated back to understand this is bigger than how well you kick a ball if you want to be a professional sports person. So I think that's the difference. And I, I think that's an advantage that I do have because um, there are most people who actually re retire from professional sport going to private schools. I've, and I've always worked in inner city state schools. And I think that's um, kind of a something unique that I bring, but I think it's really valuable for people, young boys who look like me to set, to understand that great, you want to be a professional sports person, but you have to be an educated one because you need your maths for this, you need your English for this, you need to carry yourself for this. You know, you slip up out in public, it's in the papers, your career is over. So it's important that the, the modelling and but also the conversation that you have with young people is as powerful as the, the, the algebra or the, or the literature that they're learning. Thank you. Dominic, would you like to share a comment? I think, you know, because obviously running an LGBT education charity, I'm off, asked a lot where you homophobically bullied at school. And I always say, well, yeah, everyone was. It was, there was no one who wasn't. And I don't think it had anything to do with me being like a bi man or anything. It was, it was just the thing that happened to every single person in my school, certainly. Um, and I, so I think that, and I think that it still happens, you know, the word, the word, were gay anything to do with sexual orientation to me had a bad connotation before I even knew what it meant um and I think that the you know if we think of that psychologically of young people growing up knowing the insult before they know what it means and then learning you are that thing obvi obviously is, is a tremendous burden for any young person to to face because you've you've had it drummed into you from, from 
from literally from entering school that this is a terrible, terrible thing. Um, so I'm thankful to see that lots of schools still aren't like that, though uh, I'm afraid lots of schools still are. So, you know, we still visit schools. We still hear from teachers where they were so gay. It's like the first word out of people's mouths when they're talking about like a bad pencil case or a pair of trainers or whatever. Um, that's that's really still happening. And I think that because the LGBT community has had so much progress over the last 30 years, serving the armed forces, equal marriage, age of consent, et cetera, there's an assumption that simply the passing of time, and I should say all those things relate to adults rather than young people. Um, and there's an assumption that the passing of time makes things better, that people get much less racist, that people get less homophobic, just through things sort of plodding on. And I think that it's just not true. I think there are pockets and communities everywhere where actually things are broadly the same as they were 30 years ago. Um, so progress happens because we make it happen and it doesn't happen for any other reason. Uh, so it's really important that, that we all keep going and that in LGBT work, we're talking about anti-racism and of course, vice versa. Thank you so much. I just want to say enough a thank you to all, all three of you panelists. It's been lovely to hear from you about your experiences and your views. And I, there's so much more that I would like to ask you to go into more depth about, but unfortunately we haven't got the time today. Um, but, but I really, really appreciate all of your contributions um, and also thank the audience for all of their questions. Um, and obviously you giving me the time to explore some of my own um, because what you said has been really powerful, um, really thought provoking and really inspirational. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna round everything up now. Um, and to thank everyone who's joined us today for your attendance and obviously anyone who's listening back for your time and listening back. Um, <clears throat> the recording will be made available on our Teach First website very soon. Um, please keep the conversation going on social media, uh, which I am not on, but I believe all of our panelists are. Um, you can use the hashtag future terms panel. Um, I will make sure to take a look, although I won't be joining in the conversation um, myself. Um, and certainly we would encourage you to come to the next panel as well. Um, the topic of the upcoming panel in May is going to be how can teachers achieve a better work-life balance? Um, that's going to be on the 19th, again, at half past four until half past five. And you can register on the Future Terms webpage. So if you registered for this one, it's the same again. Um, in that, in that panel, we're going to be exploring how the education sector can improve well-being and retention of teachers. So I feel there's a little bit of a thread there with this one. We've talked a lot about culture today, uh, which obviously speaks to keeping people in the profession and letting them excel. Um, but in this next panel, we'll be talking about um, lots of different options that, that are on the menu from reducing teaching timetables to remote learning, things about part-time hours and online parents' evenings. So we'll have some expert speakers to talk about what they think the solutions are that could really make a positive and practical difference to the working lives of educators. Um, obviously, I think we'd all agree when teachers are thriving, pupils can also thrive. Um, so thank you to everyone and have a lovely, hopefully sunny evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. <laughs>